Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Bell and welcome back to Core IQ where we're going to talk about life skills. Today we're going to talk about a really important topic and that is leadership. Now there's been lots of great leaders in history to really draw examples from. You've got Abraham Lincoln, of course, Mother Teresa, Dr. Martin Luther King. We've got uh, inventors like Leo Fender who invented the electric guitar. We have Albert Einstein, all kinds of great leaders and we want to talk about the traits that great leaders have. And what's really cool about today's episode is that we have none other than the Mrs. Leo Fender herself joining us to talk about what Leo was like <laughs> in real life and he, how he built an empire. I mean, the thing is, is that Leo Fender was born in a barn, literally. Am yes. I right? Yes, yes, yes. And he uh, was, uh, had an eye accident where he had one glass eye. We'll talk about that. He also was deaf, and he was kind of socially quiet, and yeah. yet he built a household name. I mean, Fender products are everywhere, and this guitar here is in the, built in the 1950s. This is a Fender Esquire, which is actually the very first model of electric guitar ever made. So it's a, it's a remarkably rare guitar. Today, Fender is a billion dollar you know, corporation all around the world. Fender's a household name. And so I'm really happy you're here to talk about this stuff. I am too. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Well, let's get going. So Leo was born in a barn. Tell us about that. Well, nobody ever believes that. Yeah. I mean, how many people are born in a barn other than animals? <laughs> but uh, that was his life. Uh, his parents were, were farmers. And uh, not with animals, but with vegetables and nummies like that. Yeah. Things that just grew in the ground. It was a, it was a life that was very silent. Mm -hmm. It was a very silent life that he had. His parents were not, not talkable. But then this is how he talked to me, was in little bits of talk. A little bit here, a little bit there. Because mm -hmm. he said they really never talked to him. So were they? Was he? Were they rich? Were they rich farmers? Oh no, no, they're very poor farmers. Okay. And they uh, had uh, vegetables and fruits mostly in the Orange County area. Yeah. They were delivered all over. Uh, Leo and his father uh, delivered these vegetables and fruits on a truck or a, a van. Uh, it was, it was not necessarily a happy life that you would want for a child. Right. He, he was very, I think that's what his quietness was about, was that he, he didn't have anybody to talk to. I got gotcha. you. And it didn't get happier with an accident that he had when he was about seven or eight. Why don't, why don't you tell us about that? Well, one night uh, when uh, Leo had uh, the, the uh, duty of cleaning the truck out because they had some squished vegetables on the floor and that was one of the things his dad had him do and he um, uh, it was a very dark night he said it when he was telling me about it it was an unusually dark evening and uh, so and he was maybe seven years old he was cleaning the truck and uh, all of a sudden he walked off the truck the step of the the bed of the truck and fell right down onto a picket fence which in which you think about it you think of, oh, it probably went through your arm or your leg or maybe even your belly but whoever thought of it going through your eye right and taking your eye completely out wow yeah it's un it's unbelievable. As a little boy, I gotta imagine that's yeah. that's not fun. No. Yeah. I bet he got teased a lot. I think the first thing we've kind of learned about leaders so far is they're not necessarily born leaders. They're not really born rich necessarily. They can be born literally in a barn and <laughs> grow up poor. Do I do I have that right? You sure do. You sure do. Okay. No. But he was a good student. I mean, he went to oh, yeah. all the schools in Fullerton. He went to elementary school in Fullerton and then the junior high and college there. Mm -hmm. uh, what was he like in terms of being studious? Because Abraham Lincoln is another great leader. He was known as being studious. Did, did Leo have that same trait? Well, I never thought of it as studious. I just thought of it as being 
uh, involved. Right. Uh, he was involved in his work all the time. Right. It didn't matter whether we were on a cruise ship or if we were having a picnic or we were watching television. He was always involved. There's one story you've shared about going uh, being at the... Uh captain's table. And the reason why I want people to hear this story is because it's about focus. Leaders are always very, very focused, very persistent. Why don't you share that story? Okay. Well, Leo and I uh, never really wanted to be spotlighted, especially Leo. I kind of liked it myself, mm -hmm. but uh, he didn't want people to think that he was showing off by sitting at the captain's table. But we were asked to be there, and so we sat down and started eating our dinner, and uh, the captain started telling all kinds of stories that he'd had around the world. It was very interesting, you know, and I was just really listening, not paying too much attention to Leo, and I, I looked over to tell him something, and I went, Leo, what are you doing? And I, and And he just looked at me, and I said, Leo, don't do that. And he was writing with an ink pen on a beautiful white napkin that will never come out of having ink on it. It was beautiful. And I said, Leo, stop that, please. The captain is still telling stories. And so he sort of put the napkin down on, down on the lap a little bit. So I'm listening to the story again and the captain, and I look over, and, and Leo's doing it again. And I went, Leo, don't write on the, on the napkins. They're going to have to throw them away. Oh, they have lots of them, he said. And uh, I said, no, 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 come on now, you have to stop. So I just started listening to the captain again, and all of a sudden Leo le leaned over and said, I'm going down to the cabin for a little while. And I went, no, no, stay here with me. And he, he said, no, uh, uh, I'm going to go down there just for a little while. And I'm thinking he had to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I would have thought. And uh, so he did. He got up and didn't say thank you to the captain and didn't say goodbye to any me, especially me. <laughs> <laughs> And he didn't talk to the other people there, but uh, he got up. And so I stayed and talked to the captain till the table was cleared off. And I went, gee, I wonder where Leo went. He then gone now like an hour or two hours. And I don't know where he is. But I walked down to the cabin and uh, I said, Leo, you didn't come back. And he said, well, I had work to do. Mm -hmm. And I said, but you were at the captain's table on this beautiful ship. He said, yeah, but I had work to do. He just kept saying that over again because that's what he was thinking. He wasn't listening to the captain's story. Right. He was listening to his brain. Well, and what I kind of get out of this story from a leadership perspective is that true, genuine leaders are very focused. Yeah. They're not distracted. And, you know, right down to the point where Leo's at the captain's table and he's taking a cloth napkin and <laughs> designing a new guitar on it. Yeah. I mean, that's how focused and passionate he was. Yeah. I wish we would have kept that napkin. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been fun to have. Yeah. That belongs in a museum. <laughs> yeah. I know that uh, he was always paying very close attention to everything. Mm -hmm. So he was not daydreaming. Well, he might have been <laughs> daydreaming about guitars, <laughs> but he wasn't just uh, kind of going nilly-willy. He was, he was focused. Yeah, on, on it. And uh, he, he was always proud of, of what he was dreaming up right. or what he had created with his hands and his mind or what his company had, had produced. And the, and the different, uh, the variety of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. So Albert Einstein, I was reading about him this week, and Albert Einstein, what set him apart from all the other scientists? The other scientists were focused on the math and on the, and the physics and that kind of thing. And uh, Albert Einstein actually struggled 
with his math. He actually had a one-on-one -on -one tutor because he, he, as I say, he struggled with it. But what set him apart from all the other scientists was imagination. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, he would daydream about what it would be like to travel on a beam of light at the speed <laughs> of light. And that's how he came out with these four papers that made him internationally yeah. famous. Leo Fender was imaginative, and he yeah. it all started at a dance, at a war bond dance yeah. in Fullerton. Do you, want to, do you want to tell us about that? Well, this was a thing that were going on during the Second World War, and um, it was for to, to get money to have things for our service people. And so the, the dances, they would collect money. And uh, so Leo went and put up the, uh, the lights and the, the, uh, uh, the PA, is it it's PA? Yeah, yeah. PA, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, and he got, he, it was, was strange for me to hear him say those things because he was so quiet that I can't imagine him being at a dance. Yeah. And, I, and I, I'm sure he didn't dance. I could almost, <laughs> all, I was not there, but I would bet anything that he didn't dance. Right. But uh, yeah, but he, he was one day was sitting there uh, listening to the band play and uh, uh, watching the, the musicians as they did their things. But he all of a sudden uh, realized that nobody could hear the guitars. There were, they were playing like, you know, and nobody could hear them. Because they were acoustic guitars. There were acoustic guitars. Right. And, the, and the, 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 all of the drums and the horns and stuff were right behind them. Right. And uh, Leo was very overcome with the waste of, of this talent. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he had his uh, his uh, company here in Fullerton, uh, his his with all of his electrical things that he fixed, anything that ran he fixed, uh, except people. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like leave the people alone. But uh, uh, he he wanted them to see and hear the musicians, and the guitarist had come into his shop, and Leo. As he, as he told this to me, uh, was he said it was almost made him want to cry that these people worked so hard. He didn't like to see waste, and these pe these people's uh, talent was being wasted, uh -huh. and that that upset him. Mm -hmm. He wanted everybody to hear. That's when Fender guitarist started to say, "Okay, let's see what we can do." Right. So he went back home and and uh, dug a, a piece of board out and took the inside out and put some inside in. Yeah. And and, uh, and guitars, real guitars as we think of them now with electric in them, um, they they started to come to life. When he started inventing electric guitars in the 1940s. Uh, people made fun of him. I mean, they called him boat paddles, and, and <laughs> yeah. they, they thought they were a joke. He yeah. couldn't sell them. Nobody would buy them at first yeah. uh, until 1950 when the Fender Esquire was released. And what's crazy is that guitar's iconic today. It's still in style. Uh, that guitar's <laughs> worth way more than my car. I can tell you that. Um, <clears throat> And it all started with with a, a war bond dance where Leo was sitting there watching people struggling to get heard. He was attentive. He saw a need, mm -hmm. and he had a skill set, and started experimenting to meet that need. Yeah. Do, do I have that right? You sure do. And uh, aren't we glad he did yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> For a lots of reasons. Yes. But, yeah. Now this is a Stratocaster. Do you see the mistake there? And it's Leo's fault. Do you see it? No. You don't? I didn't see it either. A couple of those things aren't even. I'll show you what it is. A normal Stratocaster has, a, you plug the jack in here, and there's oh. three knobs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this was a mistake. Yeah. Don't tell anybody. No, we're not going to tell anybody. <laughs> but, you know, so this, it, my point is Leo was always experimenting. Uh -huh. You know, and, and I, got, I got more, okay? Okay. In, in the 1980s, they started getting into um, solid-state amplifiers. And Leo, his amps were, 
made out of two, you know, they were worked on the tube. This is a prototype that they threw out at Fender. My dad brought it home for me because I get all the trash. <laughs> and, but this is a prototype solid state amp. It's the first one Fender ever made. And it didn't work. It didn't, and not everything Leo touched turned into a, uh, you know, a raging success. Well, how, how did it get out on the market and stuff? Well, they just kept making them better and better, and they finally they took over the market on it. But this was the world's first Fender amplifier, solid-state am prototype amplifier. And I don't think you've seen this before, <laughs> have you? No, I haven't. I, I, I got surprises for you. <laughs> yeah. Now, this one... I remember I came up to your house and I showed you this when I got yes, this. Yes, yes. This is a Fender Music Lander. Leo invented this in 1955, right before the Stratocaster. And this is, by the way, this is this guitar is going in the Fullerton Museum, I think, uh, to go on display. It's, Wonderful. This is the prototype. It didn't go into production until 1965. And I remember when you saw it, your face kind of went a little like, what? Yeah, because it, it doesn't look like anything Leo would have made. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's, you know, it is what it is. It's kind of ugly. <laughs> well, I was trying to be nice. <laughs> I'm not that nice. <laughs> yeah, and so Leo designed this guitar. I can't imagine him doing that. It went into a short production run and flopped. So my point is, you know, I, you, you know, I, I love Leo Fender as, you know, more than anybody, maybe with you being the <laughs> exception. Uh, but not everything he did was a success. Yeah. So what does that tell someone watching who wants to create a business or create something? Are, is everything going to just go to roses or are you going to fall along the way? Well, you got to keep going because yeah. we're all going to make mistakes. Yeah. And uh, people, like you said, would think Leo not making mistakes, but he did. But they were mistakes that turned into perfect, wonderful things. Yeah, yeah, they, they sure did. And he was very, very driven. I remember you telling me once that when you went to church with Leo, while the minister's up there giving a wonderful sermon, Leo was doing what? He was looking up at the ceilings and uh, checking those. He was looking at the windows. He was looking at everything that he possibly could see that might have electricity in it. Right. He was what, checking out the acoustics. Uh, the, yeah, all the <laughs> stuff. And then when the service was over and we were on our way home, he said, Somebody ought to do something about that sound system. Right. <laughs> and I felt, say, I felt like saying, uh, Mr. Fender. <laughs> now, another trait, and the, and the next one on the list is Leo Fender himself, and the word there is doer. Um, my dad, I mean, you know, of yeah. course, but, but um, for everyone out there, my dad worked at Fender Guitar, and he said that Leo Fender was indeed a doer. Oh, if, yeah. if a machine <laughs> broke down... Leo was the first one to get on the asphalt or on the concrete and get underneath there with a screwdriver and fix things. He was not afraid of coming home with uh, grease under his fingernails. Right. Um, that, that I know. Now, another example of leadership we have is Mother Teresa. And the word there is courageous because she, she really had courage to go oh. into those tough places beautiful, in India. Beautiful, beautiful, yeah. Yeah, a beautiful story. But Leo was also courageous in his own way, if you think about it, because... He, uh, he borrowed against his Ford Model A mm -hmm. to put money into the first guitars. Right. That's courage. Mm -hmm. And so he put it all on the line mm -hmm. with this invention. And then when people laughed at him, he didn't back down. He just kind of kept going. He believed in himself. Was yeah. he like that? What, what would you see in terms of him being like that? Of, of wanting everything perfect? Yeah. Well, he wanted everything perfect. He got me instead. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's he didn't mind. He didn't mind. Uh, no, uh, he didn't do things around the house, but he did things out away from the house. Uh -huh. uh, well, on a trip uh, to China that we went on, we saw some beautiful silk worms being harvested. Uh-huh. And we were going through the plant, and uh, finally the, the lady that was in charge of our group said, we have to leave now, it's 15 minutes, they, we're going to have to be back on the ship, mm -hmm. come on, you know, and, and they said, where's your husband? And I went, uh, I don't know, 
<laughs> and they, they said, get him. We have to be on the ship right away. Uh, and so we started looking. Nobody could find him. We walked around, and the lady came up and said, we have to leave now. And I said, okay, I'll go one more trip around. And I'm walking by, and I looked down, and I saw a pair of shoes that looked very, very f uh, familiar. <laughs> And it was underneath one of the machines that the guys were doing with the uh, worms. And uh, I said, what are you doing, Leo? And he said, no, you know what? He said, if they had let me work here just one month, I could make them a really rich company. <laughs> and it was a huge company. Yeah. But just let me be here. I can take care of it all. It, he needed to take care of the lady that was mad at us for almost <laughs> missing the train. So he was uh, even uh, dropping to the ground in other countries, fixing yeah. their machines yeah. too. <laughs> I, I love that story. That's awesome. And and but Leo was quiet. There's no question about that. He certainly had that reputation in the neighborhood. Very quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a kid, we were kind of told. Leo, uh, just he's a quiet guy. Leave him, you know. Don't don't bother him. Kind of you know message. But he was courageous in his own way because he's going into the music industry, which can be pretty intimidating with all the rock stars mm -hmm. and jazz stars and country stars, and get right out there with them and and develop instruments that they're taking it on stage. I mean, you can't do that and be an insecure person, can but, you? No, no, it couldn't at all. And. And the funny, funny thing is that he didn't play an instrument. Well, he did when I knew him. He didn't. He didn't play. And he played before, but not uh, not when he was with me. Mm -hmm. But he loved to hear it. But he didn't know how to do it. Yeah. So he, he didn't, didn't even play the guitar. He didn't play. He didn't even bring one home. Yeah. We never had a guitar in our home. Yeah. And uh, the only ones were f friends and family that brought their own guitar in. Yeah. That was the only thing I ever heard him say. He couldn't do. I can't do it. Yeah. So I was just up in Seattle a few weeks ago, and I saw the Jimi Hendrix Woodstock Stratocaster. Really? I think I sent you a picture yeah. of it. The white guitar, beautiful guitar, yeah. sold for over $2 million. Uh, what would Leo say about that? He said, uh, well, I'm glad they bought a Fender. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, that is the highest priced rock memorabilia in the history of the world. It wasn't Michael Jackson's glove. It was a Fender Stratocaster. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a legacy. Now, when we talk about Gandhi in India and all the work he did to get kind of the British, you know, and uh, out mm -hmm. of the country and, and declare independence, Gandhi was very, very persistent. He's very quiet, like Leo, yeah. but he's also very persistent. He, he was kind of on a mission. You, you want to talk about Leo and his sense of mission and persistence for a minute? He wanted the best. Mm -hmm. He wanted the best if he was going to buy a car. He wanted the best if he was going to buy a house. And it wasn't that he wanted to show off, because who was he going to show it off to? Because he didn't talk to anybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so, but he, he really liked things done good. And uh, the best was always good for him. And, uh, and he never, you would never know that he was buying the best for any reason other than you needed a new house or a new car or something. But he, he wanted good things. Well, and, and speaking of persistence, Leo Fender never retired. No. He, he, he literally passed away getting ready to go to work. That's true. Yeah. He, he passed away in his bedroom at our home in Fullerton. Yeah. And uh, he said goodbye the night before. Yeah. To his last guitar. Yeah. And, uh, but he never got to say goodbye to me, and I didn't get to say goodbye to him. Uh huh. But I'll see him in heaven. Sure. We all will. Yeah. He's up there fixing harps right yeah. now. <laughs> But he's well, got electric cars. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you might laugh, laugh at that. Leo always carried little tools in his in his uh, pocket. Yeah. And, and uh, I left them in his pocket 
uh, in his casket. Okay. Because I figured heaven needed him. Yeah, those uh, those angels just right. maybe get off key. Uh, something that really strikes me about Leo Fender is he's born in a barn. He's got a glass eye. He's deaf. He's poor. He builds this huge empire, mm -hmm. uh, household name. When he went to the trade shows, or he went anywhere, there was, and anybody knew, or even on a cruise ship, everybody got pretty excited yeah. about Leo Fender. In fact, when you and I go backstage to some of the concerts, mm -hmm. I, I, when we were at Willie Nelson's concert, yeah. remember that bass player that came up? <laughs> and, and what did he do when he met you? He broke down crying. Yeah. I mean, oh. it, it's such an emotional attachment to music yeah. and to the, the ingenious... Fender family brand. I, I, I've seen where the rock stars literally break down crying. Yeah. Um, it's it's, it's astounding, astounding. So Leo Fender, you know, passed away with a lot of money and a household name. He had fame and fortune. He was inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He won a Grammy Award, Country Music Award. He won everything. Yeah. I mean, how many executives do you know that invented something iconic and were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But yeah. was he humble or was he arrogant about it? Oh, no, you would never have known about it from him. Yeah. Because he he didn't like people that went, look at me, look at me. Right. He, he might like someone that said, look what I'm working on, uh, looking what, uh, what I have created or something like that. But not if they're going, we, look at me. Yeah. He would not like that at all. Uh, he wanted to make the best. He wanted people to know it was the best, but not for him. Yeah. He never wanted Leo Fender to show off. Yeah, he, he, and he had that reputation in the community. Mm -hmm. I, I grew up in Fullerton, two streets away from you, as you know, and I never heard a negative thing about Leo Fender, ever, mm -hmm. or you. Of course. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But my point is, is that he was very humble about it. He was yeah. very quiet about it. And, and that was really an important lesson that leaders don't have to be big, loud, obnoxious people. No. They can lead very quietly and very effectively. Yeah. Yeah. He wanted to walk with people more than walk before them or behind them. He wanted, he wanted to be there to help them be the best that they could be. Right. And, uh, and that was his goal, was do the best, do the best Yeah. in, in anything. Okay, so I'm going to really upset you now. Do you, see, do you see what this is? Oh, come on. <laughs> this is a beautiful guitar. Yes, it is. It's, it's a Gibson Les Paul. It's a custom. It's their, it's their nicest guitar. And why on earth would I bring a uh, Les Paul Gibson to show Mrs. Fender? And, and this surprises people. I know we kid around about this, yeah. but were Leo Fender and Les Paul? Did they hate each other? Were they? Did they? Uh, were they in a big war? Oh no, no, no! Leo wanted them to be best of friends and for the the this company to yeah. do well and for all the rest of the good guitars yeah. to get better. Yeah. And no, he said. You can go and buy, do anything, but it'll be good for the company. Yeah. And it'll be good for the music industry. Right. If you're successful, I'm successful, all the rest of them are successful, it's good. Yeah. It's good. L Leo Fender and Les Paul used to hang out and drink lemonade. I mean, yeah. they, they, were, they were buddies. Yeah. So this idea that we have to destroy our competitors and no, all that kind of no. stuff. He didn't believe in that at all. Right. There was a story in the plant that there was uh, this assembly line, and Leo would take a walk around it every day. And he's, so he's making his rounds, and there was a guy who had a job, and he was a brand new guy. He was just learning. And so Leo saw what he was doing and kind of struggling, and Leo went up to him and said, Hey, you know, can I give you some suggestions? You might want to do this and do that. And the guy looked at him and says, Look, buddy, you do your job, and I'll do mine. <laughs> and you know what Leo did? He just smiled and said, Okay, and kept going. <laughs> you know, so Leo... We think of leadership, and we think of people who are dogmatic and commanding and tell you how to do things yeah. and, you know, have this attitude and show off their money, <laughs> but real authentic leadership, and that's what we're talking about mm -hmm. when we're talking about Leo, Leo Fender, they don't do any of that. 
about. They're, they're very focused. They know what they want to do. They're not out to impress anybody. And while other people are wasting time, yeah. they, they're on a mission. Now, a word that comes up when we talk about Dr. Martin Luther King is inspiring. Mm. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, I was at the uh, Lorraine Motel where he uh, lost his life. And, and you've, I felt very inspired just being there at mm. that spot and, and kind of thinking about his legacy. And Leo Fender, uh, being a leader, he, he I don't know that he thought of himself as being inspiring, but what he accomplished in his lifetime unquestionably was inspiring. Right. I, in fact, I have a hard time thinking of, of a leader who is more inspiring than Leo because think about it. He invented the, the plants in Fullerton where the Stratocaster and the Telecaster were invented and produced. Leo designed those buildings. Yeah. So what executives go and invent something, market them, build the plants, hire all the people, manage all the people, or the <laughs> CEO from A to Z. Yep. From A to Z, he did it all. And you look back, and he he was born poor, and and nobody knew who he was. He died rich and famous, and the whole time he's calm and collected, mm -hmm. and a kind person. He gave a lot of money to a lot of charities in our community. Yeah. If that's not inspiring, I don't know what is. Yeah, it was. And you know what? He never ever would have put those words together for himself, mm -hmm. because he considered himself very. Uh, humble and also very blessed yeah uh, because of the opportunities that he had right and uh, and the talent that he had right there was there was something that kind of you asked Leo at one time what kind of drove him to do this do, do you feel comfortable sharing that story with us about his dream yeah I, I really love to tell the story okay because Nobody really thought of Leo as having a dream, right. a, the, uh, a, a working dream. But one, one day we were just talking at the table and I asked him, what got you started? What made you go uh, on, on uh, uh, making guitars and getting in the business and all of that? because it's really scary business sometimes. Yeah. And uh, and he's kept looking away, and I went, w why, Leo? You know, it's, it's, it's just us talking. And uh, he said, well, and he kept, kept taking, taking deep breaths, and he said, well, I don't like to share it, but I'll tell you. And he said, I had a dream one night. And I went, oh, that's good. Uh, and, he, and I said, uh, what, what was in your dream? And he said, and he, again, uh, stopping, stopping, stopping. He said, Jesus talked to me. Wow. And that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And uh, I said, that's wonderful. What did you and Jesus talk about? And he said, well, I always wondered why I was put here on the earth and why I did the work I did, and why I have the brain I have, and all these things. And Jesus said, the world is really a difficult place. And what we need is music. And uh, you have the ability and the opportunity to make that music happen. And this is what I want you to do, he t Jesus told him. You're going to be able to make the best instrument, and in this case it was a guitar, that anybody could have. And with that instrument, you, you are going to make the world a better place. And Leo just kind of looked at me and, and said, he really said that. And I said, I believe you. And uh, I said, I can imagine all the people in the world that have picked up one of your guitars, and look what they've done to the Lord, to the wor world, by just one piece of wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. Yeah, he, and and he he actually got a few little trickles of tears. Oh wow! Because he was he was proud that I understood what he was trying to right. tell me and what Jesus had told him. Right. And uh, and it was like a, a whoopee day, yeah. you know? 
How many times do you hear someone said, I talked to Jesus in my nap last, in my uh, dream last night? Right. You don't hear that often. Yeah, and, and you know, well, we've been backstage at a few events and we've run into a lot of rock stars and and it's interesting how a lot of those conversations maybe it's because you're there <laughs> no. uh, but but the conversations often turn to a source of a higher power and a higher calling yes the, it's not about fame and fortune and being a pig and you know how many uh, you know luxury cars I can buy it's more about authentic leadership yeah I've seen a common denominator have a faith in a higher power mm -hmm. um, so I mean core IQ is educational but I think it's an education to know the people that really achieve big the big achievers the, the, the big everybody ones. every single leader on our list here is a deist meaning they believe in a higher power mm -hmm. and at the time that Leo had that dream he was not religious at all am I right no he had had a bad experience at a church right and he said if that's what Christians are I don't want to be in yeah it. And he later changed his, life, his yeah. mind about that. But at the time that he shared this story, he was, he was not religious. So it's no. not a, necessarily a religious or not religious thing. It's about feeling a sense of calling. What's interesting, and I don't know if I've shared this with you before, but um, my dad would say it was kind of a very quiet, very quiet thing. But people down at the Fender plant, when they made these instruments, there was a real reverence for what they were doing. And there was a little, I heard it mentioned just once as a little kid, but that Leo felt that God was behind his work. Mm -hmm. And that rippled out throughout the entire facility. There was a sense of purpose there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a real sense of purpose. That was Leo's purpose. And I think every great leader has that deep sense yeah. of purpose. Yeah. And that purpose is not to get filthy rich uh, and be a pig. Yeah. It's to do something that makes the world a better place. But I think for someone who is wants to be in a leadership role or is in a leadership role, mm -hmm. I think it'd be really a smart use of time to take a look at what a real iconic leader looks like, like Leo Fender, because you will see all these traits, not just with Leo Fender, you'll see the same traits with, with Abraham Lincoln or George Washington or Mother Teresa, mm -hmm. or Dr. Martin Luther King, yeah. or, or Albert Einstein. A lot of these people have, have a similar story. Uh, most, many of them, if not most of them, were not born in, you know, with tons of money. Yeah. Uh, they had to work. They had the work ethic, they had the focus, they had a mission. And at the end of the day, they, they created a legacy and, and, and they built an enormous amount of character within themselves. Mm -hmm. And it was service oriented where they were there to really, you know, enhance the world, not just, you know, themselves. Right, right. right. That, uh, that's really lacking in a, in a lot of people. If they would I investigate some of these people that you've mentioned in your list there and see what made them so special and, right. and seeing how easy it can be to be special. Mrs. Fender, thank you so much for coming on Core IQ. I can't thank you enough. I um, appreciate it. Thank yeah, you for loving Leo and his, his babies. So thanks for watching Core IQ. Make sure to like it and share it. Tell people about it because we learn these skills that we all need in life right here at Core IQ. Thanks for watching.